Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. We are at the Wireless Broadband Congress here in London and I'm talking with Chris Bruce, Managing Director of Global Reach Technology. Chris, thanks for being here and good to see you again. Thank you, Martin. Let's get straight to it. Can you begin by explaining what Hotspot 2 is and what it means to the user? Well, Hotspot 2, also known sometimes as Passpoint or Next Generation Hotspot, is the means by which a Wi-Fi device connects seamlessly and securely to a Wi-Fi network. It um, can be achieved through authentication through a SIM card, if it's a phone, or if it's a device that's not SIM card connected, like a tablet or any other type of device, through a certificate or some other method of authentication. Um, it really is the way Wi-Fi should be. It's, it's transparent to the user, they just connect, um, and they just notice that they're, they're online. I, I recently attended a um, conference in Portugal with the HTNG, which is the Hotel Sector Technology Group, and um, we had a hotspot to network there, and I was sent a profile in the form of a QR code, which I could just scan with my iPhone, download it very simply onto my phone, and that was my profile. So when I arrived at the hotel, I literally walked through the foyer and I was automatically connected to the uh, Wi-Fi network in the hotel and the conference room for the whole period while I was at the event, about three days. Absolutely fascinating. I was fascinating when you said it's the way Wi-Fi should be with a, with a wry smile. Um, why hasn't it been like that? Is it because the technology wasn't developed or what? Well, one of the challenges with, with Wi-Fi and I think all technologies is that you have an ecosystem that needs to embrace and deploy it. And Wi-Fi uh, operates in an unlicensed spectrum. It hasn't been protected with, with, with purchase spectrum. So there's a very, it's a very disparate um, community, if you like, with vendors on, of hardware and devices and operators and, and many others. So it's needed the whole industry to move together. Three fundamental groups, as I mentioned, operators, the technology in the devices and the technology in the um, radio equipment. Yeah. It's in all of those three things. Um, and it has been deployed at, at uh, many, many events for, for quite a while and is now beginning to be deployed, particularly in the United States, widely. Um, and it really just needs to be adopted. And um, we're now seeing that happening much more widely. Um, and it's really about getting uh, venue owners now understanding that the way to satisfy the customer with their Wi-Fi experience is to allow them to get on. Not put a barrier in the way, a captive portal, they have to put in a password and a pin and all that sort of stuff. Just allow them to get on. And if you want to communicate to them, to remind them how great the experience is in staying at their hotel or drinking their coffee, there are other ways you can do that through your rewards program and all sorts of things. But you're not going to be rewarded by frustrating them to get connected. Very true. You mentioned the user experience then, Chris. How does Global Reach help improve that user experience? Well, Global Reach technology is a software a provider, and we enable Wi-Fi operators to deliver this hotspot to experience to their users. Uh, we do that on a white label basis through uh, operators or venues so that they can offer an experience to the users. Um, and that can be uh, authentic by us authenticated by a SIM card, it can be through a portal if you wish, or it could be through a certificate anyway. So that's, that's how we do it, we just make it nice and easy. Okay, $64,000 question and a bit more uh, really is, does Wi-Fi have a role to play in 5G networks? And if so, what is it? Absolutely it does. And I think with this topic we have to distinguish between 5G new radio and the, con the overall umbrella concept of 5G. Sure. And um, the cellular world, which started off as being voice-oriented, has moved more and more data-centric in the various generations of Gs, 2, 3, 4, now 5G. And the Wi-Fi world, which started off as being very data-centric, but small cells, um, had, but more best efforts in the early, early days, has become more grown-up, more carrier-grade, more secure, uh, more dependable, more reliable. Um, and the latest generation of Wi-Fi, called Wi-Fi 6, 
actually has got a lot closer to a carrier grade radio technology. If you look at the way networks will be managed in the future with the splitting of the software and the hardware, NFV and SDN or the whole thing, the whole concept of network slicing comes into play where with 5G, as, as you know, you're trying to address a whole range of user cases from low latency to high throughput to mass broadcast to um, automation, all those different use cases, critical um, IoT applications be very difficult to create one complete solution without either compromising on performance for some use cases or an overhead in cost. So why not use slicing as a technique to draw in the different technologies appropriate to the use case? And that's where Wi-Fi has a role to play, as Wi-Fi 6. And if you were to look at the target specifications drawn up by the IEEE for Wi-Fi 6, previously known as 802.11ax. <laughs> Chips off the tongue, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and 5G, new radio. And if you superimpose the two, you will notice that the use cases, the diverse use cases for 5G new radio, compared, drawn up by the 3GPP, and that drawn up by the IEEE for Wi-Fi 6, are very interestingly similar. Not all cases, but in many cases, the Wi-Fi can actually perform as well, if not better, than 5G new radio. Perhaps not on mobility, because it's not designed for that. But if you look at latency, it's lower latency target, throughput, density, all the things that, as a data-centric technology, it's always been good at. But the point is not, you know, one is better than the other. From an operator point of view, you have a use case, you have a cost to deliver, you have an expectation by your, your users or the things that the user wants to connect, you have to deliver that at a, at a cost that is acceptable and uh, an experience that's going to satisfy. And in my mind, the, the more sophisticated operators will use different technologies to meet a use case. And in that way, there's no reason why Wi-Fi cannot become a slice in a converged 5G Wi-Fi platform. Interesting. So all the talk we've been hearing in various parts of the industry about Wi-Fi is going to die within the next decade is just so much hot air. Well, whilst we've been talking like that, or some people have been talking like that, another three billion <laughs> Wi-Fi devices were shipped last year. <laughs> yeah, proof of the pudding, really. There is a huge installed base of Wi-Fi devices. If you just look at the home, you know, you ask yourself, 5G in the home, well, there may be use cases for it. But you have to remember all of the ecosystem of things that are in your home now that has Wi-Fi attached to it. Your TV, your camera, the air conditioning, all these things. At what rate will they be swapped out for 5G? I think uh, you know, that'll take a little while. Um, and actually, some of them may never be swapped out for, uh, for 5G. It may more likely be LoRa or Bluetooth. There's going to be a whole myriad of technologies. So I think it's... Um, a false premise to see, you know, one technology is going to overtake the other. Actually, there's going to be a coexistence. Thanks, Chris. Finally, could you give us uh, an example of the use cases where your software is, is, is being used now? Well, Global Reach technology, our software, is used in high-density, high-utilised environments. For example, the London Underground. So we support the operators on the London Underground, a very, very uh, highly congested environment, as you, as you know. You're telling me. <laughs> You've travelled recently. <laughs> and, and the the Wi-Fi, as you know, is on the, on the platforms, uh, but not in the tunnels. That's just the, the way it is. Um, and it makes a very interesting and challenging use case. If you think about it, the London Underground in rush hour, a tin can arrives called a train, and in that train there are sort of 700 people. Their devices are connecting to the Wi-Fi on, on the platform. That process of authentication is happening in seconds. You've got 40 seconds before the passengers leave, some others come on, close the doors, and away you go to the next station. A minute later, the same thing's going to happen again. And that's just at one station. So you've got that happening in all the lines of the station. And the other thing that's interesting, while, we're, while we at Global Reach are working with Virgin Media to manage that, what happens when those seven, 
the remainder of those 700 people who stayed on the train go to the next station. It's going to happen all over again. And then some of them will stay on, most of them will stay on to another station, another station. Actually, we have to help make sense of where, where all these devices are connected. And is that the same one as that chap that was there and that chap there? Because we're, we're going to get very, very confused otherwise. So we specialize in those sort of quite complex, high volume environments, whether it's transport, retail, hospitality, or um, other high density outdoor locations. It's an incredibly complex thing about that. Say you've got a, a, a train with 700 people on, as you say, and it's like one of these old questions when you were at school, you know, how long does it take to fill a bath with this, and you know, all that kind of thing. If, let's say 700 people are on it, let's say half of them stay on, uh, and then half of those get off again at the next stop, and one, the ones at the original one, 20% go somewhere else, and so they've gone to another line, but they're still all connected and registered, you've got to work out who they are, yeah. identity-wise, as they're traversing the underground yeah. system. That is complex. Well, of course, we've, we've lost them in the tunnel, yeah. and they pop so up somewhere to, else. You've got to be the refound. Yes, yes, and they will then, when they get through to the next station, that email they were halfway through writing they want to send, or that page they were refreshing they want to do then. Yeah. So that's that's the clever bit. It is very very clever. I mean, I don't also also we have, I've got to forget. There's advertising in the stations, um, TV advertising in the stations that comes and goes between the trains and everything else. It's an enormously complicated business. Now, where do you start, really, seriously, with something like that? Well, um, we have some clever people, yeah. and we work collaboratively with our partners, who provide the rest of the service. Um, but yes, we've, we've got a very flexible platform that allows us to handle very large environments with lots and lots of devices and lots and lots of people. So market-wise, for global reach, it's a silly thing to say really, but everywhere there's a metro system or a tube system, there's a potential market for you. As you said, hospitality, hotels and all that sort of it. So you can be deeply into vertical market. Correct, yes. So transport's always been a, a very important area for us. We're in airports in, in the UK. Uh, we're on planes uh, with, with an airline that's hubbed out of the Middle East uh, and we're just rolling out another airline that's hubbed out of uh, Mexico across the whole of Latin America. So planes is quite interesting. Um, the origins of the, of the sort of forerunner of this company was a company called Meshhopper that provided uh, a wireless network across the, along the River Thames for connectivity on the boats in the Thames. So. Um, we know, th we know the transport world very well, and, and it has particular challenges and opportunities. But we've also moved into areas like Westfield, uh, which is a very high-density shopping mall environment, has its own challenges, um, and others. So we're, um, we're focused on those sorts of areas where we can, it can draw to our strengths. Fascinating. Really, really fascinating. OK, Chris Bruce, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Martin. Not at all. Pleasure to see you.